Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me this evening in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. This is the fifth episode in the Conversation with Alan series, a series I started to have open and honest discussions about the rise of hate and, and the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States with high hopes that it leads to a conversation that makes us all think about our own place in history and what we can do together to change our country's course. Tonight, you will meet a group of individuals who are working to spread the message of 3GNY. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit organization founded by the third generation, the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. 3GNY's mission is to keep the history of the Holocaust alive. Through their We Educate program, we do, 3GNY trains grandchildren of survivors to share their family story in school classrooms. They must ensure that others understand the human face of the Holocaust, as well as its details, its place in Jewish history, and how it is viewed through their work that future generations will hear the actual stories of their grandparents' survival. All of my guests tonight feel a deep commitment to, to know and to share these stories and to place them within the greater context of the Holocaust. 3GNY also raises, raises awareness about human rights issues and genocide past and present. To accomplish all of this, 3GNY creates forums where members meet, learn, connect, and share ideas. Founded in 2005 with a group of six, 3G's membership now exceeds over 4,500. 3GNY organizes diverse programming, including museum tours, film screenings, theater engagements, discussion groups, book readings, visits, and dialogue with survivors, Shabbat dinners, Jewish cultural events, intergenerational gatherings, genealogy workshops, and field trips. My first guest tonight is David Wachs, who is the president of 3GNY and is the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. He has been active with 3GNY since 2005. He joined the group to connect with others, others who have a similar background and to carry on his family's legacy. David took on a leadership role in 2010 in planning and organizing events. Please welcome to the locker room, David Wachs. Hey, David. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted you to know, I started this series, be, you know, it was my way of doing something in response to Charlottesville, um, you know, in 2017, but I only started this about a year ago and I was trying to, you know, back then I was thinking when Charlottesville happened, I wanted to find other two Gs because I'm, you know, the second generation Holocaust survivors, um, you know, and I just couldn't get something together. But I, you know, at that moment for me, I realized I could no longer keep silent and, you know, needed to speak up and do something. And I'm so glad my friend Lisa uh, told me about 3GNY and led us to speaking tonight. Yeah. Um, how early in your childhood do you remember learning about your grandparents' stories? Well, I would say I didn't know the actual stories, uh, you know, uh, until much later in life. It was always kind of known that they were Holocaust survivors and they're both my father's parents, but it was never really discussed. We never asked questions. It was never talked about. It was only really in later in life when I tried to explore what's going on. And, and 3GNY kind of learning about 3GNY had helped me kind of, uh, you know, light a fire under really finding out the stories and documenting them. So not only I know, but my family knows uh, as well. Were, were your grandparents still alive at the time that you started figuring this out or were they had passed on? No, both had passed on. My grandfather had passed when I was eight years old only. And my grandmother was 20. Uh, I was 21 when my grandmother passed away. So it was uh, so you really didn't have you really had to go in search of their stories. Yeah, yeah, it was um, it wasn't the easiest, uh, but I did get a lot of information from my father, my aunt, and also uh, some of my grand my grandmother's uh, sister was still alive. Later on, I interviewed her and also a great aunt uh, who was related as well, and uh, I used those as the mo basically the to to basically craft most of the story. That's only for my grandmother. Uh, my grandfather, I know even less about. I only 
know most of it from my father. Wow. Um, can you share some of the stories that you know? Sure. Um, so my grandmother grew up in a small town in Poland that was close to uh, the, the Vistula River, which kind of was where uh, the German and Russian armies uh, split Poland. And she had uh, talked with her friends and they were uh, saying that supposedly life was better for Jews on the Russian side and they were on the German side and the Germans were about to invade their town. So they crossed the river in the middle of the night and they were actually captured by Germans and they uh, were put in a barn and uh, a lady who owned the barn actually snuck in and told them that people were captured there before and were executed. So they slipped out from the barn, they escaped and they went across the river and the Russians stopped them and said, um, you know, turn around or we'll kill you. And they basically said, if we turn, if we turn around, they're gonna kill us anyway, so may as well shoot us here. But they didn't shoot uh, shoot them, and they they get captured them, and they put them in work camps in Siberia. So my grandmother was in a work camp in Siberia for about two years, and when the Russians made a pact with the Allies, they were released, but they couldn't go back to Poland. So she was put on a farm in Kazakhstan uh, for the rest of the war. My wow. grandfather. Oh, do you want to have a question? Yeah. Well, I was I was curious. How old were they at the? Do you know? Uh, during the war around? Most likely my grandmother was 21 around the time uh, of, which was 1939 when, when war broke out. My grandfather was, was three years older, so he's 24, but he was on the Russian side, so he's what is now Ukraine. He grew up in the town of Brody and was in um, Lemberg or Lviv at the time of war. Uh, he was made, as most Jews were, to fight in the Red Army, and he was pretty proud of it. Um, he's a barber, and uh, the story I know of how he survived is that a general really liked the way he cut his hair, so he kept him off the front lines. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, people were saved for stranger things, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. Um, yeah, my, I mean, my parents were much younger. My mother was like age three to eight and father was about a teenager during that time. You traveled right to their hometown and, and have been to some concentration camps. Yeah, I, I was searching for, I think it is in 2012, I went to my grandmother's hometown. I was searching for actually any evidence of a lost brother who we never found any information out after the war. She did reunite with a, another brother and sister after the war, but the younger brother was always missing. And I did go to her hometown. And recently in 2019, in the fall, I went to my grandfather's hometown of Brody, Ukraine as well to explore if there, I could find anything there. But I did not find anything from, from either side, but I've been to also to, you know, many concentration camps through Poland and, you know, different uh, areas that were considered, you know, concentration camps or remnants of ones in Ukraine as well. Well, what is it, what is an, you know, I, I have yet to do that. I would like to at some point, um, but. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's an experience and it depends how you go. I would say, you know, some of these organized trips really do it well. Uh, my sister, when she was 16, went on March of the Living and really got like, I would say, a crazy experience, especially at that age. And if you're going as a tourist and you're kind of going along on your own, you probably don't have a tour guide telling you all the intricate details of what's going on. So I did go with my sister in 2002 to uh, Maidanik, which was one that was pretty powerful and left untouched. But as a, as a person just going to visit, I probably wouldn't know everything to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and now a lot of people shy away. They say uh, they can't go, they can't bear to see this type of thing. But I, I think it's very important for everybody to go and see it because once you see it, you can't unsee it. 
I, I completely agree. I mean, my, my grandfather and my aunt were, you know, killed in a camp and I def, you know, my, my grandfather, like your grandmother was also, you know, a worker for a while, but he, you know, sadly lost his life. Um, so 3GNY was created in 2005. Did you, that's when you found out about it or, you know, can you talk about some of the early genesis of the organization and your involvement back then? Certainly. Certainly, I am not a founding member of it, but I did join as a participant shortly after. Um, uh, one of the founders, Dan Brooks, he, I think he went to a 2G group and, you know, went and saw that, you know, why is he the only 3G person here at a, a meeting of descendants of Holocaust survivors? And he put kind of a call to action in like some type of like local newspaper or something in New York and five people came out and they formed the original six person board and launched the organization in 2005. Um, I would say it really just started meeting in like the back of like coffee shops, having discussion groups, talking and uh, had kept getting more and more of a following where more and more people were coming there and there was Shabbat dinners, there was speakers, there was film screenings, there are all kinds of different types of events. Some are, you know, purely social, but most are of them are content driven. Uh, you know, we've worked with uh, psychologists discussing, discussing trauma. Um, and in 2010, we launched our education program, which is we do stands for we educate so w-e-d-u but uh what we do is we train grandchildren in how to retell their grandparents stories to make the greatest impact in like uh, on the next generation and we put them in classrooms between sixth and twelfth grade so incredible and it's so interesting was it you know like i said for me charlottesville had a very you know, powerful impact on me when the, when this group got together in 2005, was there something or it was just, they just, you know. I don't think there was any like specific event that brought these people right. together. I think it was just a thought process. Um, really smart. Like, hey, why is there, why is there not a group for grandchildren and how are we all connected and let's explore this. Like there is a, a thread that connects us all in, in some way. Absolutely. I could, could not agree more. Second generation, third generation, we have to continue these conversations. Why do you, you know, share for people watching who, who may not understand why it's so important to share these stories and educate others about those atrocities? I think it's really, it's, you know, I, there is some type of, you know, weight on our shoulders where we have this it's not just about, you know, saving these stories, it's about using them for good. And by, you know, using the stories and being the most likely, in most cases, the last people to know these survivors who experienced this stuff, we can hope to, you know, make an impact on the next generation or generations, uh, plural, that we can say, promote these stories, use these stories to promote tolerance where people are not going to go after somebody just for what they look like, uh, what religion they are, or anything like this, you know, at all. And and this is what happens. And these, this is how bad it can get. And it can. And, and, and it's, you know, sadly, we, we've seen right now the rise of anti-Semitism um, so much, you know, it's something I've always known existed, but, you know, 2017 and then January 6th this year were, were real eye openers. Um, can you share your response to those two? Um, I, I have to say, uh, it wasn't an eye opener in terms of, oh my God, there is anti-Semitism in America. Uh, or anywhere, I feel that uh, anti-Semitism has always been around and I've personally experienced it at different times, uh, even, you know, as recent, you know, personal experience as recent as 2015. But um, what, it, what it was, was it was 
it wasn't like, oh my God, this is happening. It's, it's, oh my God, this is acceptable. This mm -hmm. becomes acceptable. Like these people are empowered because they feel that they can go out there in this way and be accepted in this manner. And I don't think that really happened, at least on a grand scale uh, by any means before then. And that's really what's I think that this is becoming an acceptable thing in daily life, that people can be anti-Semitic and it's okay. People can hate for no reason. And it's know. acceptable, and right. which is crazy. It's just insane. 100%. What, you know, you've been there 16 years. What are you most proud of in those 16 years? I would say, um, I would say I'm most proud of the fact that 3GNY had a mission when it started that had three, three main ideals. One is community. The second is reflection. And the third is education. And in five years, in five years, they accomplished all three. So they created this 3G community. They are reflecting and using these stories to create discussion and, and how to do better by, by, by what we know. And um, education, we started the education program to hopefully improve lives of the next generation. And they did that in five years. Uh, really, I'm just, kind of hoping to refine it and expand it and do good by all the founders of the organization. I've only been president for three years now, so uh, I'm just hoping that uh, I can do good by them. <laughs> well, keep up the great work. But before I, I, I let you go, I want you to tell us about your personal project, the Wandering Jews project that you <laughs> and your sister have done, because I think it's fascinating. Um, the Wandering Jews was started in 2016. Historically, my sister and I had always gone home for the holidays to our hometown uh, synagogue for like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And the rabbi that we grew up with had retired. And we decided maybe we should travel for the high holidays. And uh, in doing so, we would be able to showcase uh, different synagogues or communities that people don't know much about in these ways. So we went to Alabama in 2016 for the first year and we documented nine synagogues and some are active and some aren't, but we've been, you know, all over the world. And the idea is to document using, using the idea of the historic synagogue buildings as a, as a backbone, we travel to see these buildings and document um, the history of the buildings and the communities to showcase to places of Jewish history where a lot of people say they don't think about Jews being in the South. Like, well, at least from New York, it's like the first thing it says is there are Jews in the South. <laughs> so <laughs> we try and showcase this. Uh, you know, the last one we went to in 2019 was in Montana to Butte, Montana. There's only 18 Jews left in Butte, Montana, and uh, they would not have had a minion uh, for um, Rosh Hashanah, if we weren't there, there was only eleven people at services. With wow. that so well, everybody needs to go take a look at that website and check it out. It, thank it's you. Up on <laughs> great job, David. Keep up the great work with Three GNY. Thank you so much for being here. I will uh, bring out your uh, cohorts next. Your colleagues. Right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Stay safe. All right. So my next three guests are all grandchildren of two Holocaust survivors. Sharon Cooper is in constant awe of what her grandparents went through and how they persevered. She has always strived to preserve their story and becoming active with 3GNY and the We Educate program was a perfect way to achieve this. Farrah Krauss works as a treasurer for 3GNY initially, and initially became involved with 3GNY in 20. 10 to participate in the We Do program and has spoken in over 50 classrooms. Joseph Zende became involved in 3GNY in 2018 following his grandmother's death to better understand her story of survival by learning to tell it in the We Do program. He continues to speak in many classrooms in the New York metro area since to share his grandparents' story. Since 2010, the We Educate program has trained over 250 descendants of survivors 
visited multiple classrooms in over 100 distinct schools, and spoke at, spoken at many organizations in the tri-state area and beyond. Impact, it has impacted over 25,000 students of all ages in public and private schools. The classroom presentations include a formal presentation followed by a Q&A for students and teachers to have a dialogue and connect history with current events, intolerance, and justice. Please welcome to the locker room, Sharon Cooper, Farah Krauss, and Joseph Zende. Farah, Joseph, and Sharon, thank you all for being here. Thanks for having us. You're so welcome. Joseph, I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, Senda. It's okay. Zenda. It's hard. It's okay. <laughs> so I, I, I'd like you all to take take turns uh, if you want to start, Joseph, and, and tell your grandparents' story. Um, okay. Um, well, um, my grandparents are from Hungary. Um, they uh, really uh, met and fell in love uh, in Budapest um, in the years uh, leading up to the war. They were in their 20s um, during the war. So um, I really like to um, humanize them, you know, give them, give the kids a sense that they were, they had full lives and they really um, were living life to their fullest. And maybe in, in Hungary more so than other places, uh, Jews were really integrated into society and were doing all sorts of things that uh, Gentiles were doing. Um, of course, their rights started to be taken away from them and uh, the the war uh, made it more and more difficult for them. Um, I'm I'm going to give a, a quicker version of the story, but basically, um, my grandfather was enlisted in forced labor during the war and was often separated from my grandmother. Um, during that time, um, my father was actually born in the ghetto in Budapest. Um, and during the same months that uh, my father was just coming into the world, uh, my grandmother's parents were uh, taken away from the countryside in Hungary and uh, taken to Auschwitz and killed there. Um, so uh, it was really, it was really with um, very mixed and difficult emotions that my grandmother had to survive the year of 1944. Um, and it culminated with my grandfather being taken on a very difficult forced labor uh, task um, that he knew was they were out to kill him on. Um, and he miraculously escaped and walked back the distance from the Hungarian-Ukraine border to Budapest, a distance which is uh, equivalent to like walking from Baltimore to New York City. And um, the end of the story is that this guy with uh, a scraggly mustache that looked nothing like her husband came up to her and said, uh, and she said, what do you want? And he said, I'm looking for you. <laughs> and that was how the war ended for them. Wow. That's great. Farah. So uh, I share my grandmother's story in schools because I know more about her story. Mm -hmm. um, she was born in a small town in Poland and, and says she really didn't notice a lot of anti-Semitism as a kid. When the Germans took over Poland, her town was invaded. And at first, um, initially her brother was shot in, in their hometown right away. And the rest of her family that was there at the time was taken to a transit camp where my grandmother said a lot of people just died of starvation. Um, and then they were put on cattle cars and taken to Auschwitz. Uh, where my grandmother got lucky and was selected to live. Uh, one, her and one of her sisters were the only ones who were originally selected to live. Uh, her sister died fairly early. And my grandmother actually um, survived because she got in trouble for something. And as a punishment, they sent her to the portion of the camp that had no Jews in it. So she wasn't up for selection for six months. And then um, a lot of the German uh, women who were prisoners became low level guards in the camp and they were able to look out for her. So she survived in Auschwitz for over two and a half years. And then, and then she was marched to uh, Robinsbrook. And when she got to Robinsbrook, she actually describes Robinsbrook as being like death because she just says nothing was happening there and people were lying in the snow waiting to die. 
Um, and then after my grandmother was liberated and she was finally got permission to come to the United States in 1949, and she was originally taken to, uh, went to family in New Orleans. And at the time, New Orleans was a segregated city and my grandmother felt very uncomfortable there, told her family she was gonna visit a friend and come back, got on a bus and took herself to New York and never looked back. And um, she was riding the subway one day and she met a gentleman who had numbers on his arm. They started talking. They realized they both had family who had gone to Argentina before the war. They made a date. Um, my grandmother remembered she had another date for that night. So she ran home, knocked on the door of the other single Jewish girl in the building and said, I have two dates, you have to take one. <laughs> and both of the couples actually ended up getting married. Oh my God, that is a great story. Uh, Out of tragedy can yeah. come some happy endings per se. And Sharon, for you? Yeah, so I usually talk about my grandfather in schools. Uh, his name is with Sam Grunman, and he grew up in Ludge, which is a pretty big city in Poland, where things quickly started to change for the Jewish population. Uh, when the Nazis came in, the first day, actually, the cattle cars were, were full when they were sent out to the street. Uh, so they said, okay, we'll be back for you tomorrow. And at the time, my grandfather's father said, we're not waiting till tomorrow to see what happens. And they left for a really small town in Poland called Bing Lashim. And they were somewhat safe there for about a year or so, considering it was a time of war. Uh, until then, the Nazis got to Bing Lashim, and uh, my grandfather was uh, sent to various work camps throughout, throughout the country. And at that time, most of his family was taken to Treblinka, uh, which was the second largest death camp to Auschwitz. And uh, I know you and, you and Dave were talking earlier about visiting camps, and I actually um, had the opportunity to visit Treblinka a couple years ago and have this memory of walking these steps that most of my family walked to their death. Um, and there really wasn't that much left there. There's a few stones and a few memorabilia, but most of the most of what was done was, was covered up. Uh, my grandfather was one of the seven out of the 77 members of his family to survive the Holocaust. And after, after the war, after the Holocaust, he was in a deportation, um, sorry, a um, displaced persons camp, which is where he met my grandmother uh, who had survived Auschwitz. Wow. How early did you understand what your grandparents had all lived through? Was it at an early age or did it come later? As a kid, I always knew that my grandparents were Holocaust survivors but I didn't think I actually knew what that meant. I didn't really know or completely understand what the Holocaust was. Uh, and at a fairly young age uh, in school, I had seen a movie about the Holocaust, a reenactment of what happened. And that's when it kind of all clicked together for me and uh, had these loving, loving grandparents that um, I couldn't fathom that they had been through what I had just watched in the movie. And at the same time, seeing my grandparents and how they seemed so normal to me, um, you know, A, how did this happen to them? And B, how does this not happen again? How does this not happen in my lifetime? Farrah, noticed, for you, did, oh, did, go ahead, Joseph. Um, I, was, I was just gonna say when I, um, I went on a trip like a March of the Living, it was with my own Jewish youth group, it wasn't called the March of the Living, but I went with my grandmother and um, it, I'll never forget that when we were at Auschwitz for her, it was her only and first time visiting. It, it was something more like going to visit a grave for her than uh, um, a learning experience. Um, and um, I, that to me was the, the very personal experience of the Holocaust for our family that it, it didn't matter that it was, you know, it was 2001, it was decades after it had happened. This was like the personal murder of your parents. You were going to see the place where it happened. You know, the Holocaust was 6 million stories, but for us, it's the story of those two people who we lost in our family very close to us. It's, and, amazing, uh, that she, it's amazing she could go there you know, I, I traveled, my, my parents were hidden in uh, 
hidden away in Holland in Amsterdam in the outskirts. And I, I've been to the farm where my mother was hidden away, but I can't imagine, and with my mother, but I can't imagine going to a concentration camp with my mother. I don't think she would have been able to, to handle that very brave and uh, of your grandmother to do that and, and to do it with you, I think is even um, more incredible. Uh, we were able to take my two younger nephews before my mother passed away back to the farm so they could experience and see where her and her mother were hidden away. But it's so important. And, and Farah, for you, how early do you remember? So I, I don't remember ever not knowing about the Holocaust, um, especially because I had like a set of grandparents that were survivors and a set of grandparents that weren't. So I remember like a very, it was just very different if I was with, you know, one set versus mm -hmm. the other. Uh, and I went to a Jewish day school and I rem don't know why, but I remember we talked about the Holocaust in kindergarten and my grandfather like passed away that year. So I remember like at the Shiva hearing some stories but I would say like in elementary school, I went through a phase where I pulled a lot of the books about the Holocaust off the shelves in the house and started, re you know, reading. And my grandmother started sharing little bits of, you know, her story with me. But um, I don't think I do really understand what she went through. I don't think it's possible to really, truly under you know, understand what, what they went through. I, I completely agree. You know, uh, if you heard earlier when I said Char Charlottesville for me was really thankfully my parents were both deceased at that time or that's how I kind of felt because I couldn't imagine really my mother knew anti-semitism was around every day of her life but that was just so blatant 70 years after world war ii and what she lived through that sitting in her living room let's say and we were watching the tv I just couldn't imagine what her reaction would be and it's you know she shouldn't have had to see it, you know, and I was glad she didn't, but that's why what you do, I think is, is truly so incredible. And it took me a very long time to grasp, you know, what my, I, I was probably 28 when it all clicked because for me, Schindler's List came out and there was the girl in the red coat, which was how old my mother was during the war. And sort of right around that time, my first nephew, was born and from a New Jersey hospital, my mother used a pay phone to call what was like her best friend, which was the daughter of the people who saved her life where she was hidden for two years. That was the first phone call, she, you know, and it's just like all those things that converged at that time. Um, but I do, I, I don't think I spoke about it back then as much as I do today. I think what, you know, all of, all of us, are doing by using our voice is is so uh, so important. Um, Farah, you said you got involved with 3GNY for the We Educate program initially. Um, what was it like when you first got there? And sure, so um, my cousins were actually involved in bringing We Do to 3GNY back in like 2010. So I was able to join the second class and at the time we would meet at facing history and it was a two session learn how to tell your grandparents story over time we have shifted and now it's a four session class and it's it's more filling i guess um but when my cousin first started telling me that she had this idea and this is what 3gny was doing i just thought it was amazing and it was something i really wanted to be a part of um having gone to college in the midwest i realized that a lot of people like had never met a survivor, had never been exposed to a survivor story. And for me, that was a little shocking because I don't want to say spoiled, but like I grew up around so many sur survivors that it, it never crossed my mind that other people wouldn't have had that experience. And um, I just realized it really helped me realize how important it was to, sh you know, to continue mm -hmm. sharing stories and to talk about it. Wow. Um is there a specific age? I think I said, what, what's the age that the program focuses on? So sure. we speak to between fifth grade and 12th graders. Um, yeah, that is, that's the, the main yeah. goal. Do you, do you all remember speaking in your first classroom, Sharon? You know, for me, I think most classroom visits have the same nerves 
that come before mm. one. Uh, you know, you're getting ready to be very vulnerable and very open and share something extraordinarily important and close to you with a group of people that you've never met before. You don't know how they're going to react. Will they pay attention? Will they care? And without a doubt, every time they pay attention to a T and they do care and they are engaged, and they do ask questions. So you feel like your work and the time that you took out of your day and going through the training and doing this program is, is valuable. I think the most memorable experience I had was the first talk that I gave after my grandfather passed away. Um, mm. I think after that talk, that's when it continued to like really sink in that this is now my responsibility to carry on his legacy. I remember that being the one that was really hardest for me. And I remember calling my mom after um, in just like a way to kind of have some kind of connection to him as this now was, I felt like it's the official passing of the torch to share his story. It's true. And he'd, he'd be really, that you know, that's what I do think about. I think all of them would be very proud that, that we're not forgetting because it is so important. Joseph, do you remember your first one? Um, I similarly remember the nerves and um, there really are some logistics of just being a teacher for one class period that you have to remember. It has a beginning bell and an end bell and <laughs> you have to fit within those boundaries. <laughs> and as important a story as it is, so is lunch and the next period and they are still kids in school, you know? Um, so I, I, I remember being nervous and it took me a few tries before I felt like I was really hitting my stride. My best experience was definitely with the youngest kids. Um, I did a, a class of fifth graders and, um, like no other class, they were just hanging on every word. You know, I thought that it would be advanced material for them, you know, emotional subject matter, shocking but um, they just were so engaged. And um, my, my favorite part of the visits are their questions, um, just seeing how their minds work and what, um, what comes up for them, what sticks with them, you know, the emotional impacts of various parts of the story. Um, that's, that's, what I, that's what I really like. And I feel like with high school, they, as, as much as that is the time in the curriculum that they really are learning about the Holocaust in a more deep way, I feel like they've started to become a little more cynical with regard to class speakers and they really have to be, um, they, they're not naturally hanging on your words in the same way that fifth graders are. That's interesting. Uh, I have only spoken once and I did it virtually because of this show opened an opportunity because I had shared my mother's story and a school in Atlanta had asked me to speak. And it was much more like Joseph says, it was a high school. And I think they were interested, but you know, I, it, you know, I, I, I totally see what you're saying. What, what, what are some of the different, re, you know, questions you, you get from, let's say the fifth to eighth grade and then the high school kids. Do, do you know, Farrah, like, can you no. pin? For me, I think sometimes with the younger kids, it tends to be more factual questions. They want to know about the number on their arm. They're, they're, they're very specific, sometimes more factual questions. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger picture, but a lot of times they're, they're simpler questions. Um, as the kids get older, they, they become more conceptual. They're, they ask more questions about, you know, maybe why did the Holocaust happen? Do you see similarities between the Holocaust and things that you know happen at other times in history? Um, and it also, I guess, depends a little bit on you know the level of the kids and the type of the class that it is, and how well the teacher prepared them. In the classes where the teacher really prepared them for us, the questions are always, you know, better. Are there? You know, we we've spoken of uh, Charlottesville, but there was the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh you know, the Capitol insurrection, have any of the real life events come, you know, the, the more recent events come up during your presentations? So, so okay. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say it's interesting. I don't think the events have come up specifically, but I think um, some of the underlying causes of the events have come up. Like last year for the first time ever, I gave a presentation. It, went over well in the class, the kids were asking good questions. 
And then a child raised his hand and asked me if I felt guilty about being Jewish. And when I kind of said, well, what do you mean? He didn't know what to say, but the kid next to him started whispering in his ear. And I said, oh, you mean because Jews run the media and they control the weather? And the two boys started nodding. And that was the first time wow. in over 10 years of speaking that I'd come across something like that. So I, I, I think it's connected to the events in a way where I just think it's like what David was saying, it's out there, it's become acceptable. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I would have gotten a question like that in any classroom 10 years ago. Uh, I definitely. I mean, I think people do feel um, like they have the right to express things that they wouldn't have 10 years ago, for sure. There is no doubt um, for that. What were you gonna say, Joseph? Um, I was just gonna relate a story that, you know, when I was doing the We Do training, in the middle of the We Do class, the, uh, the, sh the Tree of Life shooting happened. And so we came to a class with all of these people who are trying to learn how to tell their grandparents stories. Um, and we were just faced with a room that on the one hand, you know, we were horrified that, uh, you know, history was repeating itself, but it also was so affirming that at least we're here, you know, this program right. is here. Like we were doing the right thing at the right time, you know? And um, that, that sort of cemented in my, mind and in my life the need and the necessity for this program and I, i'm going to recognize the fair transition from being a student and we do to helping to teach the class so she was she was one of my teachers and uh i the the first 3g story i ever heard was her story as an example story for how we uh would be learning to tell it ourselves interesting and carol who's watching was just relaying how it's incredible, Farah, to hear the story that you just told that the anti-Semitic stereotypes are still being uttered by these young children because they're being expressed so freely. Um, can Farah, can you talk about what goes into the training? Sure, so right now the training, it's, it's a four week program and we keep the classes at 12 participants even when we move to like Zoom because we find that when people could talk to each other and make connections, it really you know, helps people get their story going. And we just help people frame their grandparents' stories. So in the first class, we get together as a big group and we talk about why do you wanna share your story and what impact do you wanna leave on the children? And even like, what would you be upset if you left the room and they didn't get as a way to start thinking about how to put your story together. And then the next three sessions are just story building. So we do a class on outlines. So people come in with an outline and we discuss them in groups. And people like Sharon are wonderful facilitators who, you know, who help um, people move forward. And then the next week we ask people to do um, like three to five minutes of their presentation or something that could be in their presentation. So for like me, um, I shared the story of like, of how my grand, like where my grandmother got in trouble in the camp. And you, we do that so you could practice storytelling, how, how you tell the story um, and how you share details. And then in the last class, we break into small groups and people share a 20 minute version of their presentation. So we sort of just go through the steps and help people put the story together. What's the one thing you'd all be upset if you walked out of the room and didn't leave them with. Do you remember what that was for each of you? So for uh, when I took the class, we didn't do that. But for me, I'd say um, for I want to when I leave the class, I want students to, to know that they should be kind to each other and stand up for each other. I usually, oh, go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> I usually end by uh, letting them know that my grandfather lived a very, very, very long life and that he had nightmares about this experience until the day that he died. Um, and that now it is my responsibility to tell his story and that I ask the students to keep in mind and remember his story, uh, just to be further advocates to, to keep in mind what happened in history. Um, and then, you know, I used to end with, let's keep, you know, let's keep this in mind so that this 
it's all to you and I didn't let this never happen again. And that's become really hard to say now, um, knowing what's going on in, in the world. Yeah, you're you're bringing tears because it you know it, it's um powerful, powerful Joseph, and Joseph, uh, are, do you do Joseph? You have a child, right? I do. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, because you know I I find that has ha has got to have an impact on you as well. Yes, absolutely, and I I haven't even begun really to think about how I'm going to introduce him to his family history. We're still working on uh, toilet training. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know he's, he's young, <laughs> but um, uh, in terms of what I want the room to be left with when I speak, um, I really have a story that's bookended by my parents, by my grandparents love story um, that they, they meet and fall in love at the beginning of the story and it's their love that really is the their means of survival that um this undying need to get back to your partner get back to your family that um, allows my grandfather to basically do the impossible i love that we yeah. you know we, go ahead sarah uh, Oh, I, I just wanted to add, um, you know, I think it's a really important and good question to think about how you pass this along. And I'm sure it's something that we all think about, um, you know, for, for myself and my parents, my mom and I almost joke about this now, but in third grade, I came home one day and asked my mom, my assignment was to write about my family history. And my mom just started crying. And I said, oh, I, I can just make it up. No worries. And, you know, and went on and knowing now thinking back on that situation it's it's such a hard scenario on how you begin to pass this along and I know in my family it's something that's so important um that you know my grandparents didn't talk a lot about it and generation after generation I got up the guts to ask a lot about it in order to have that story to pass it along yeah I agree I mean I you know I definitely knew my parents were holocaust survivors my dad really didn't talk about it. I knew that this family existed in Holland uh, that saved my mother. You know, she would write letters to her and, you know, speak to the girl who was her age. Um, but, you know, I know every day of her life how difficult it was. And that's why, you know, a year ago when this pandemic started, I started this. I, I I didn't have a platform. And, you know, when Charlottesville happened, I didn't have something. I I was, you know, in my own head trying to find, you know, what to do. I had written to someone who had uh, written an op-ed in a Jewish newspaper, but I didn't hear from him. And I was talking to my cousins. You know, I wanted to do something because I really felt there were other two Gs like me, you know, like three Gs like you who needed to continue to share these stories because, and, and we know we're doing the right thing. I mean, when, you know, Charlottesville and, and to see, you know, the capital insurrection and to see any human being wearing a t-shirt that says 6 million were not enough is unacceptable in 2021. And I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> you know, it's just not, you know, it's these stories you know, uh, yeah, I try to s say it all the time. I don't know if you know, you know, my mother's story is um, she was saved by a family that had nine children. So they risked 11 lives for my mother and her mother, you yeah. know, you know. And when I shared that story in the show, I, I, you know, think about it. What would you do? I mean, I don't know that I, you know, my sister says it to this day. She has two children. You know, she doesn't know what would you do. It's a really powerful thing. You hope you would make the right decision. And and it was their 17-year-old son who convinced them to take my, you know, strangers in. You know, it's really, I, I think the work you do is I incredible. Um, if someone is watching today and they are a 3G grandchild of a Holocaust survivor, what would you recommend they do if they wanted to join the WeDo program? So uh, e email uh, WeDo at 3G New York spelled out dot org and um, 
we'll put you on the list for the next class or the class after it because I think the next class is already filled. But do you each have a um, a favorite movie or a favorite book that has helped you in this journey of understanding? You know, I personally relive my grandparents' story a lot uh, when I go into schools. You know, I've kind of gotten used to it, but the first couple of years I did this, every night before I went into teach to teach in a school, I had a hard time sleeping. Uh, and so I actually, my way is I actually kind of stray away from books and movies, and I just try to focus on my own family story in order to tell that. Uh, but participating in these We Do trainings uh, again and again is it's such a blessing to be able to con continue connecting with 3Gs and continue talking about what resharing our story means. And I think hearing other stories um, is extremely meaningful to me to remind us what our grandparents went through. So for me, I really enjoy hearing it from, from us and hearing those real stories on a weekly or monthly basis. The truth, yeah, I mean, the truth is much more powerful. I mean, the, you know, yeah, for sure. Joseph or Farah? Um, well, I, I, I find I need to read whatever materials are, um, are being read by the students and the most common one is night. Um, so I do often try and reread sections of night, uh, before, uh, the class, because then I can say, remember when this happened, remember mm -hmm. this chapter, this part of the story, it's phenomenally useful to have them have a reference point of something rather than going in completely, you know, cold to learn about this story. Um, and although our story is not the same as night, there are some similarities and that, that helps convey the story. Mm. Yeah, like Joseph, I try to read what the kids are reading if I haven't already read it. And same, I think like night is the book I appreciate the most only because like my grandmother is really good at remembering the 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 exact the facts and exactly what happened but she can't recall any of the emotions of the time like of when she was in the camps but like Ellie Wiesel does a really good job of sort of getting into the mindset especially when he says like I turned right and three people were shot but tomorrow I could turn left and you know it could be me and like that's something my grandmother couldn't explain so for me like being able to read someone who was able to sort of remember the emotion of it I guess brings a little bit more you know, to the story. Mm -hmm. I, I might need to pick that up again. It's been a very long time to, to read that book. Um, for whatever reason, and excuse me for the word favorite, but is there a presentation that has had a large impact on you for a specific reason, somebody you met there, whatever the reason? I did a presentation where the students actually were asked to write an assignment, a one page letter reflection on what they had heard. And when I heard that that was a set the assignment, I asked the teacher if it was possible to get a copy of it. And these were, wow. yeah, it, it just was amazing just to watch and see and have them reflect that they were truly listening and thinking and processing every aspect of what I, of what I was saying. You know, they would reflect on a part of the story I would tell and they would say, I can't believe how Sharon's grandfather survived that or how he did that. Uh, so that was very impactful and something that I hung on to. Yeah. I, I think that's actually a really incredible teacher that class had, because I think that's really powerful for them to, for, for even the teacher to see how they interpret a story like that. Yeah, and it was interesting. Each and every one were extraordinarily meaningful for me to read and in a very different way. Oh, I, I, I they'd be in a drawer. I, I would hold yeah. on to them forever. You guys, Farah, Joseph? I, I love getting letters from the students. Um, but and I think sometimes just in the Q&A when the kids ask really insightful questions, especially sort of trying to compare what happened then to what might happen or is similar um, now, sometimes you're sort of taken by surprise that the connections that the kids make on their own. So I, I think anytime that happens, it's pretty impactful for me. Yeah, I, I also had a, an experience of having the, the kids write thank you notes to me. And um, 
one thing that emerges through that is there there are, sometimes are Jewish kids in the class, and so they they'll let you know that they feel seen. You know whether it's oh, wow. they you know they themselves are three G or they're more likely to be four G or five G. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they're in the young uh, class, or, for sure. <laughs> they've learned about it, you know, through their own synagogue or through their own Jewish education. And um, I think that that's important, you know, it, it, I, you know, because it's not just, I mean, obviously I don't want Farah to receive a, a anti-Semitic comic when she visits a school, but just imagine being the kid who's in that class, you know? So um, I, I want to be there for those kids and, uh, and, hopefully eliminate all forms of racism, not just anti-Semitism. No, I completely agree. And, and again, what you're doing, uh, Felicia just said, I'm a Holocaust educator and was involved in the adopt a survivor program in New Jersey. Most have passed now, but I'm pleased about the work. The blog, we share the same sky by three G is excellent. And Catherine was asking, did any of your grandparents do an interview for the Shoah foundation? My grandparents did, yeah. My grandmother did. No. Yeah, and my, my both, we convinced them to do it um, after Schindler's List. Um, again, those are so important too. Did I, is there anything I didn't ask that you wanna convey if somebody's watching? So if, if you want to learn more, either visit our website or send us an email and uh, be happy. And also, if you are an educator and you are looking for speakers for your school, please definitely reach out. We have we were able to train 62 people over the pandemic. So we have a lot of new speakers in addition to our 250 previously trained speakers wow. who would love to get into your classroom and share their grandparents' story. So you've trained 62 over the pandemic, adding mm -hmm. to the already. Um, how do most find you? Is it online or through things like this? Or you I know? think initially probably a lot through word of mouth and people and local events in New York. Um, and since I guess the pandemic started, our virtual events have been reaching more people. And um, David yeah. said you've been able to do a lot more outside of just New York City too because of the the virtual. Yeah, we've we've done trainings for people in California, DC. Um, we were even able to speak at a school in Montana. Uh, so there there have been you know some benefits to the crazy year for the right. organization. Is is there a um, larger three G outside of New York that you're all a part of? So I think 3G New York is the largest organization and we're the ones who like started the WeDo program. There are a lot of other cities who have created 3G programs, some who use WeDo, some who are doing other education programs, because I think all 3Gs understand that there as, especially as there's less and less survivors, it's really important that we carry on our family stories. Well, that's the perfect way to end it there because it is we we do need to do that and thank you farah thank you sharon thank you joseph for for sharing with me with the audience i really appreciate you being here because you know i i'd like to keep doing this and keep you know we have to keep these stories going and make sure that people never forget so stay safe thank you so much for being here great thank you very much thank you great. you're so welcome Bye bye Thanks everybody for being here today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, conversations with Alan are usually once or twice a month. Again, I am doing this because I want to use my voice to make sure uh, we speak about the rise of hate, the rise of racism, the rise of anti-Semitism in our country and put an end to it. Have a great night, everybody.